It was an ordinary day for a 20-year-old hardworking young mother who loved her family and her job. She wasn't even supposed to be working at Pizza Hut that morning, but a simple shift switch led her to coming face to face with pure evil. The horrific tragedy and the investigation that followed would show the world how corruption can spread like poison. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea, and if you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. This case is really important to me because I have seen it covered before, and I haven't really seen it told in a way that truly honors the victims. And yes, I said victims because, as you will come to find out, there are many things to reveal in the story. This is one of those cases that actually made me very angry because of all the lies, but I'm definitely getting ahead of myself. So first, let me thank our sponsor for today, which is the Paired app, and you're gonna like this one. It's a relationship care app that I've been using with John for almost two years now, and I think it's important to incorporate healthy habits that can strengthen your bond with your partner and improve your relationship or keep it going strong. The Paired app offers daily couple quizzes, relationship games, questions, and exercises, and these prompts help you to have meaningful conversations as a couple. And I love that you can complete them on your own time, anywhere. You don't have to be right next to your partner, but what's cool is that when you answer, it unlocks their responses. For example, John did a quiz about disputes called Got Beef, and it asked questions about the way that he felt when someone disagreed with him or had something against him, let's say. In order for me to see how he feels, I am alerted that he did the quiz and now it's my turn to unlock his answers by answering the questions myself. But here's the catch. I also have to guess how John answered the questions to see how well I know him. And then the app will show you who won, who guessed more responses of their partner correctly. And I feel like that really helps you to get to know one another. It even helps you talk about some subjects that might be a little harder to discuss. Look at all the quizzes, games, and exercises that we've done. You can also push discuss answers and leave notes for your partner or talk to them in person about them. So for fun, we're quickly gonna reveal some of John's questions and answers and the ones that he might've gotten right or wrong about me. Your partner sees you chatting <laughs> to someone attractive. What do they do next? Make an introduction. That's, yeah. What, <laughs> Stop and John's answer about you. Ask follow-up questions. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. What do you mean? Later she'd be like, who was that? What do they want? Why are we talking to them? Who was that? <laughs> what did they want? Why are you talking to them? When your partner is given a gift, would they rather... I said no preference. Opening gifts is always fun. You said open it in front. You, you said I would open it alone? Yeah. <laughs> Especially to give, look at Why? Christmas. I haven't even <laughs> opened. He hasn't opened any, like five gifts of mine. I haven't even opened some of his gifts. I'm not ready to, I want to extend <laughs> exactly. it. I want to extend The next Christmas. I really love how fun it is. Plus it's backed by leading experts and research. And I can't wait for you to try it. So just click my link below and get a seven day free trial and 25% off Paired Premium so you can maintain and deepen your connection with your partner. Thanks so much to the Paired app for supporting this channel and making today's video possible. Now let me introduce you to Nancy Lena Lovelady DePriest. But to do that, I have to take you way back to when her parents met for the first time. The year was 1967. When Eldwin Lovelady and Jeanette Stalecup met at the Clover Drive-In Theater in Fort Worth, Texas, Eldwin, who went by Eddie, was from Louisiana. He was a mechanic in the Air Force, and he had served in Vietnam. Jeanette grew up in Fort Worth with her four sisters. She was in a tough financial situation, and she was only 14, so her mother pushed her to get married to her next-door neighbor. Jeanette dropped out of high school and had her first child, Rita, at 15 years old, which was pretty tough. I know for young moms, it's really hard to balance the responsibility of motherhood and experience being a young person yourself. Jeanette's mom ended up raising Jeanette's daughter, Rita, and Jeanette dropped out of high school, got divorced from her neighbor husband, and started to go to work. When she finally turned 18, she went to a drive-in movie. And that's when she spotted the most handsome man she had ever seen. Eddie. Eddie and Jeanette fell madly in love. Before they knew it, they were married, Jeanette was pregnant, and they were headed for Spokane, Washington for Eddie's job. Eddie was a bit of a nomad, 
Even though him and Jeanette lived off base as a sergeant, he was always working and traveling to new places. Jeanette was a bookworm, but she spoke her mind and made friends very quickly. On March 4th of 1968, the couple gave birth to their first child, and that is the subject of this case today. Beautiful little Nancy. Just 14 months after she was born, her parents had her little brother, Eddie Jr., who was, of course, named after his father. Jeanette found it a struggle to raise kids at such a young age, but she did her very best. Unfortunately, when she heard a rumor that her husband, who was spending most of his time stationed in Japan at the time, had a girlfriend overseas and had been cheating on her, Jeanette got understandably upset. But instead of running away with the kids, Jeanette decided to leave everything behind, including her husband and their two children. It may not make sense to us, but we were not in Jeanette's shoes, and there's a turning point coming up, so be patient. Jeanette was, like I said, understandably very confused, angry, and of course felt betrayed. Eddie filed for divorce in August of 1973, and then he took four-year-old Nancy and three-year-old Eddie away to live with him in Japan. So Nancy's first memories as a child were made in Japan, and I have to say, that must have been a very fascinating experience. It's definitely on my bucket list. Nancy was forgiving, thoughtful, and generous, and I have to wonder if much of those values were instilled in her through the Japanese culture and her spending all of those years there with her father. But the family did move around a lot, and Nancy was back in the United States by the time she was 10 years old. She stayed in Louisiana for a little while, then San Antonio, and also Mountain Home, Idaho, where her dad chose to settle down and get remarried. He had three more children, Nancy's sisters, Jerry Lee, Wendy, and Beth. Now, you may be wondering, whatever happened to Nancy's mom, Jeanette? Well, by that time, she had gotten both married and divorced again, and had been working at Walmart, which she really liked for the discounts. Having their mother back in their lives was definitely not easy. Jeanette and her son, Eddie Jr., had a bit of a strange relationship. After all, Jeanette didn't spend time with her kids for several years. However, Nancy, as I said, had a very forgiving nature, and no matter distance or time, she loved her mom more than anything. She believed in second chances and developed a very close relationship and friendship with her mother. Actually, in 1983, Nancy decided to move with her mom to Graham, Texas. Graham's a decent-sized town with a population of about 8,500 people, and when I look at Graham, all I can think of is stereotypical Texas. Lots of wilderness and recreation opportunities at Graham Lake, and it has the largest town square in all of America. Believe it or not, Graham still has an operating drive-in theater. And I know that I've mentioned drive-ins twice now, so I have to know, have you ever gone to one? I used to go when I was in high school in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with my boyfriend at the time and our friends, and I'll never forget hiding our friends in the trunk so they could get in for free. If you've never been to a drive-in, I think you should try it at least once if you can still find one. Jeanette's grandparents actually lived in Graham. That's why Jeanette moved there. Now living together, Nancy and her mom were like sisters. They were so close. They did everything together. Nancy and Jeanette were part of the Episcopal Church, and Nancy helped her mom out with the bills as well, getting her first job as a waitress and second job at Pizza Hut. Nancy's brother followed her to Graham as well. Eddie loved his sister, even though he wasn't so close with their mother. Nancy spent high school working, studying, and she even participated in some beauty pageants. She was stunning. She was an all-American Texas girl with the blonde hair, blue eyes, and a gorgeous white smile. I also noticed she rocked the blue eyeliner and shadow, which I love. It's very iconic 80s. And of course, since it was the 80s, Nancy put a lot of effort into her hair. And you could tell she had those curled bangs that might have been held up with a little or a lot of hairspray. Not only was Nancy beautiful on the outside, she was beautiful on the inside. I know people say that, but Nancy was a people person. She was bubbly and outgoing. She had so many friends, and she'd be laughing and chatting with a new friend every day. She loved to talk on the phone, and many of us still do, but not as much anymore. This was landlines when you just had one in your bedroom, talking, and having fun, which she loved. If you invited her to anything, roller skating, hiking, bowling, Nancy was 100% down for anything. She loved to ski. She also liked to fish. It didn't really matter what activity. She just loved to keep herself busy. And she left a positive impact on the people she met. 
It was mid-February of Nancy's senior year of high school when she met a handsome man who swept her off her feet. His name was Anthony Todd DePriest. He went by Todd. He worked at a ranch about an hour away with dreams of joining the Air Force. He was a few years older than Nancy. She had just turned 18 at the time. And Nancy came home just raving about this new man and how she wanted to get married. So, of course, Janelle was kind of like, slow down. And she freaked out because Nancy reminded her so much of herself when she was 18. And Jeanette knew that it hadn't worked out between her husband and her at the time. So she didn't want Nancy making the same mistake. She hoped that Nancy would graduate high school and go to college before starting a family. But when Nancy wanted something, she did what she wanted. She loved Todd. So on her birthday, March 4th, she moved in with him in Granbury, which was about an hour and a half drive away. On May 1st of 1986, they were married. And soon after that, Nancy graduated from high school. It was the definition of a whirlwind romance. Jeanette was left devastated. She struggled to accept that her daughter was married, but she knew the only way to keep a relationship with Nancy was to learn to like her man, Todd, and let Nancy make her own decisions, even if it meant living through making mistakes. Some of us have to. But just because a person gets married young, it doesn't mean it's a mistake. The thing is, Todd didn't like Jeanette either, which was understandable since it was the typical mother-in-law, son-in-law situation where the mother-in-law didn't fully support the decision of the person her daughter ended up marrying. But Jeanette just wanted to protect her daughter. But Nancy was an adult, and when she found out she was pregnant with a baby girl, she felt completely blessed. That's one thing Jeanette knew Nancy wanted, and though she didn't want Nancy to experience it this fast, Jeanette always knew that Nancy wanted to be a mother. And she even said that she thought Nancy was actually born to be a mother. She was just so loving and caring. Eventually, Todd was living his dream too. He got into the Air Force, landing a job as an aircraft maintenance specialist. By December of 1986, he and Nancy decided to move to Austin, Texas, where he could work on the base and she could get a job through Pizza Hut. She had been working there a pretty long time and moving up the ranks. She planned to work for corporate one day. They moved into an apartment at 2000 Cedar Bend Drive in North Austin, Texas. While the big city was an adjustment, Nancy absolutely fell in love with it. I love Austin, Texas, but especially she fell in love with her Pizza Hut community. There were 23 Pizza Huts in that area alone, but some people would work at multiple restaurants and hop around, and they would even do Pizza Hut softball tournaments. Nancy worked at three different locations in two years, and she felt like the people that she met were like a second family to her. Nancy welcomed her daughter into the world in July of 1987, right in the middle of the hot, muggy, sticky Austin heat. She named her Sylvia DePriest. She was born with a thick head of dark hair, just like her dad. They look like twins in this picture with Nancy. And Nancy was so in love. She talked about Todd and Sylvia constantly. They were always on her mind. She had this dream that once Sylvia was a toddler and old enough to walk, she was going to buy her one of those little motorized Corvettes, you know, like the Power Wheels ones. In April of 1988, Nancy started working for the Pizza Hut near I-35 at 1011 Rainley Street. I'm going to say Rainley. I like that way that that sounds. Even though last video, I got so many comments with people saying that I was saying Arkansas wrong. I know how to say Arkansas. Arkansas, Kansas is an actual place in Kansas, and it's Arkansas. So we're going to call it Rainley Street. And she was working as an assistant manager. She showed all of her coworkers pictures of her family, and everyone knew she loved her life. And I can't say this for everyone in management positions, but Nancy was a great manager, and she was happy with her job. She was caring and understanding as a supervisor, and she went out of her way to help others. By October of 1988, Nancy was 20 years old. Her baby daughter was just over a year old, 15 months to be exact, and Nancy had a routine. She would spend the mornings taking care of her daughter and the evenings managing the Rainley Street Pizza Hut. And when she wasn't working on the weekends, she would spend her time with Todd. I mentioned that Pizza Hut had a softball league. 
Well, Nancy was one of their most dedicated players. It wasn't that she actually loved softball. She wasn't really a softball person, but she loved events, and she absolutely loved connecting with people. Like I said, she was truly a people person and just genuinely nice to everyone. So that's why being on the team was something that she dedicated much of her time to. That's actually the reason she had to switch her shift on Monday, October 24th. She was supposed to be working Monday night on the 24th, but that conflicted with a softball game. So she asked one of the managers to switch AM and PM shifts, and she asked her babysitter to take Sylvia that morning. Nancy woke up on the 24th, put her work clothes on, and made the 13-minute drive to Pizza Hut with baby Sylvia in her car. Whenever both Nancy and Todd had to be somewhere, Todd would do what he did that morning. He'd follow behind Nancy on his motorcycle because, of course, they needed the car seat for Sylvia, and they only had one car. Then Todd would switch to the car after Nancy was dropped off at work. Then he would take the baby to the sitter, bring Nancy's car back to her workplace, and then leave on his motorcycle. It sounds complicated, but this was just one of their routines. When they arrived at Pizza Hut, it was 7 o'clock a.m. Todd left his motorcycle in the parking lot took Nancy's keys, drove Sylvia to the babysitter, then came back to the Pizza Hut to get his motorcycle. He arrived back there around 7.40 a.m. He knocked on the employee door of Pizza Hut, gave Nancy her car keys, and gave her a kiss goodbye. Then he drove away on his motorcycle in the direction of the Air Force Base, not knowing that that was the last time he would ever see his wife alive. It's always so shocking for me to think about that part because you just never know. You may wonder why Nancy is getting to work so early when Pizza Hut doesn't open until 11 a.m. It's more of a lunchtime dinner spot. Well, Nancy needed extra time because she needed to open the store, go through all of the checks and everything from the night before, but she also needed to start making the pizza dough. It was part of the morning shift and the responsibility of the key holders like herself. Even though Nancy was all alone in the restaurant, all the doors were locked so Nancy was completely safe. But when Nancy's general manager called her at 8.30 that morning to do their Monday morning check-in, she didn't answer. And that was a little odd because Nancy was usually a very responsible and responsive employee. Perhaps she was just busy. So he waited a few minutes and he phoned her again, but Nancy still didn't respond. By 9.30 that morning, when her boss still couldn't get a hold of her, he began to get worried. The store had to be open on time. And of course, he was also concerned about why Nancy wouldn't be answering after calling her again and again, over and over again for the past hour. That wasn't normal. He decided to head over to the restaurant, wondering if maybe Nancy forgot that she'd switched to the morning shift or to see if she was just running behind or busy. When he arrived, he noticed something unusual right away. The employee door was not locked. And usually, this door is locked until normal business hours. But what this meant to him was that Nancy had made it to the restaurant and unlocked the door. But he wondered why she seemingly hadn't locked it behind her once she made it inside. Upon first glance around the dining area when he stepped in, he didn't notice anything out of the ordinary until he actually took his first few steps further inside. That's when he was concerned and confused. The restaurant floor was covered in water. It was about an inch deep all over. It looked like somehow it became completely flooded. So what happened? He called out to Nancy. He doesn't get a response. As he stepped deeper into the restaurant, he can see and hear that the dough machine was still running in the prep kitchen, which meant that Nancy was there. But where was all the water coming from and where was she? The manager knew that something wasn't right. He walked towards the counter, which faced the front of the store, and then passed the counter and around the corner And that's when he realized that the water seemed to be coming from the men's restroom. When he opened the door, he realized why Nancy wasn't answering. He saw her bare, unclothed body lying beneath the sink. This was a horrible sight for him to see. She was clearly unresponsive, bleeding from her head, her blonde hair stained red, and he knew it was Nancy right away. Her eyes were still open, but it's like she couldn't see him. She was just staring blankly. The manager rushed back outside to alert the authorities. Rookie cop Officer Scott Ahart from the Austin PD was dispatched along with his partner. When they arrived and they got inside, they too saw all the water on the floor. They noticed there was more of it in a higher concentration near the restrooms, 
which made sense. They made their way into the men's restroom where it seemed like the water was pouring out. When they open the door, they see the woman lying inside. As he's quickly looking around, taking everything in, he sees what he described as spots of coagulated blood in the water next to her. He could tell that she was tied up with her bra, and it appeared as though she had suffered a gunshot wound to the head. Of course, by the initial appearance of everything, Officer Ellert thought she was deceased. But then all of a sudden, he saw what he thought was her breathing, and as he got closer, he realized that she was still alive. He started talking to her, trying to get her to respond, but she didn't. All she could do was gasp for air. So, of course, they radioed for emergency services, and they rushed Nancy to the Brackenridge Hospital. She was in very critical condition and not expected to survive. Medical personnel quickly began working to try to save Nancy's life. She underwent emergency surgery before they even had a chance to officially identify her. Her family was unaware that this normal day at work would turn so deadly. Imagine her mother, her husband, just going about their day as usual this whole time, knowing none of this was happening. Notification would have to wait. It was the hospital's first priority to do what they could to save their patient's life. Meanwhile, investigators from the Austin Police Department had been called out to the Pizza Hut. And once there, they immediately began processing the crime scene as though it were a homicide. They started putting the crime scene tape up and the Pizza Hut was closed to the public for the foreseeable future. First, they wanted to look into the cause of the flooding, which was obvious once they examined the men's room. Stuffed into the sink, plugging the drain, was a blue apron. The faucet was still running, and the water had overflowed onto the floor, which caused part of the restaurant to flood. It was highly unlikely that Nancy had been washing her clothes. This was clearly an attempt by the perpetrator to wash away all the evidence. Right near the toilet, on the ground, there was what looked to be a pair of khaki pants and light blue underwear crumbled on the ground, and the lid to the garbage pail was on top of them. Nearby was a white button-down dress shirt, which appeared to have blood on it. It made sense that these were Nancy's clothes. Her bra was used by the assailant to tie her hands behind her back, and it was still on her when she was taken away from the scene. The person who did this tried to get rid of all the evidence, but there was something obvious they left behind. A single 22 caliber shell casing which was submerged under the water right next to where Nancy had been laying. All this evidence was collected and taken back to the crime lab for analysis, even though it was the 80s, even the late 80s. It was a lot different back then, nothing close to what we can accomplish today. Considering Nancy was nude, though, the investigators assumed this was a male perpetrator, and they believed she was most likely sexually violated. At this point, they went through the Pizza Hut looking for signs of a struggle. When they looked at the lock on the door, it was completely intact. There was no sign of a break-in. So they began to wonder if Nancy had let her attacker inside and whether she knew them or maybe they followed her inside, overpowering her as she entered, or did this person have a key? There was a sign of a struggle. They found one strand of hair in an area of the restaurant where customers waited for their pizzas and they played arcade games. The hair was missing its root which would make it really hard to identify through DNA analysis. But it was still the best evidence they had. And I'm sitting here thinking, how do they know that a single hair in a restaurant where so many people frequented would be related to this crime? And I get it. Everything's important, no doubt. I'm just wondering. I'm a curious person. I cannot help it. But next, the investigators checked the cash register, wondering if this was a robbery. Because that year... There had been a string of robberies in Austin, and the criminals were actually targeting Pizza Huts. I'm not sure how much money Pizza Huts usually have in the store, but it was the 80s, so lots of people were paying in cash. In the four robberies, no one had been hurt, and all those robberies had occurred in the late afternoon and early evening, so it seemed unlikely that this was connected. But when they got to where the safe was, the floor safe in the back of the restaurant, it was open. Now, if you have not seen my video on Robin Hoynes, the Kentucky Fried Chicken murder that also happened in the 80s, these floor safes were very common back then. It's where employees would deposit their nightly cash, usually in a bank bag, but not in this case. It seemed to be missing. They checked the receipts, and there was exactly $150 in cash unaccounted for. Of course, this was enough to raise a red flag, but they wondered, would this warrant 
taking Nancy's life. Maybe she could have identified the robber and they decided this was their only way to silence her. Or Nancy may have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. I can't help but think if she had worked her normal shift that night, maybe things would have been different, but that means that maybe someone else would have been hurt. It just breaks my heart when I think that she shouldn't have even been there when this crime occurred. Sadly, Nancy wasn't doing well at all. They had done all they could to try to save her life. She was the only witness. They were hoping that she would somehow make it. Not only so she could tell them who did this, but because investigators had learned she was a mother and a wife, and they were so saddened by what they had witnessed. She was so young and had so much life to live. Unfortunately, Nancy was in a coma clinging to life. She was put on life support while her loved ones were contacted so that they could say their last goodbyes. Todd was at the Air Force Base when he got the call that Nancy was in the hospital. It was a moment of sheer panic. He had just seen her that morning. How was she now on life support? He dropped everything and drove his motorcycle to the hospital. When he was given the information about Nancy's condition, he called Jeanette. Jeanette and Eddie Jr. had just moved to a tiny home in Cedar Creek Lake, and it didn't even have a landline yet. Jeanette had spent the whole day going to convenience stores looking for jobs, so she didn't get home until 4 p.m., and that's when her landlord knocked on her door and told her she had an emergency call. Jeanette picked up the phone, asking, what's the matter? And Todd said, it's Nancy. There was so much fear in his voice that Jeanette knew that something was wrong. Jeanette's like, is she okay? And she was freaking out at this point. And Todd said, there's been a robbery and she's been shot. Jeanette asked him how badly she was hurt. And that's when Todd broke down crying. And in between the sobs, he told Jeanette that Nancy was on life support and she probably wouldn't make it. That the hospital staff had given him the go-ahead to pull the plug whenever he felt ready. Jeanette, of course, was distraught. She was hysterical. She just screamed. But in her heart, she knew that Nancy would not want to live in that state, unable to truly live. And she agreed with Todd to take her off life support, but she begged him to please wait until she could be by Nancy's side. And he told her he would. Jeanette was three and a half hours away and not immediately able to get a ride. While Todd stayed by his wife's side, Jeanette was not able to get there until early the next morning. And at 10.45 that night, the doctors pronounced that Nancy had irreversible damage. They could keep her on life support, but unfortunately her wounds were so bad that the moment she would be taken off, she would die. Right after Jeanette arrived, she kissed Nancy and told her goodbye. It was hard to turn off that machine knowing that that was it. Nancy was an organ donor, so through her tragic murder, she was able to help several people who needed transplants, and she was able to donate her heart liver, both of her kidneys, and her bone marrow. This procedure honors and respects the donor at the same time as harvesting their organs, and it takes between 24 to 36 hours to complete. Afterward, professionals are still able to move forward with things like an autopsy and funeral arrangements, which would come very soon. Right after Nancy was pronounced dead, her case was officially labeled a homicide investigation, and a homicide detective, Hector Polanco, was assigned the lead on the case. He was notorious for being quick and dirty with his investigations. He did whatever he could to always close his cases and get that confession. They were counting on him. Detective Polanco talked to the general manager since he'd be the one to find Nancy that morning. He had a good alibi and was ruled out as a suspect, but he was able to provide important information about the standard routine for Pizza Hut managers and shift leaders like Nancy, who had a master key to access all the stores, not just that location, which meant that the key holders could walk into every Pizza Hut in Austin, Texas. This meant there was a very big pool of people that he needed to interview who could have targeted Nancy. But first, they want to rule out everyone who worked at the Rainley location and then move on to other stores. But at the same time, their prime suspect was actually Nancy's husband, Todd. You know, the one who just pulled the plug? but his alibi checked out quickly. However, investigators were going with the theory that Nancy knew her attacker. Because she was so reliable, she wouldn't have just let anyone inside the restaurant, unless they were familiar to her or they were a fellow employee. It was also relayed to Polanco that Nancy 
had called a produce company around 8.30 in the morning and spoke to someone there and made an order for some items for the restaurant. That was the last time anyone had heard from her. So they had somewhat of a time frame between 8.30 a.m. and just before 10 a.m. when her manager found her. By the next morning, Nancy's case was already all over the Texas news. Officer Polanco did his best not to reveal any of the details of this case to the public, hoping to catch the perpetrator by what they knew about the crime. Nancy had been such a bright, nurturing young mother, and though very few people knew how badly she'd been hurt, they wanted the person that did this to be behind bars. There was already so much pressure being put on authorities. That year, there were 45 homicides, and there were no crime scene investigators back then. Homicide detectives did everything. There were only six of them, and they were burning out. It was not an easy task. They had to go to all the crime scenes at any hour, day or night. They'd be called in and they'd have to immediately stop what they were doing and rush over, sometimes working on more than one case at a time, processing the crime scenes, submitting all the evidence, handwriting their notes and the reports. It's a lot. And many of them were working 48-hour shifts with no sleep. You have one job as a homicide detective, to solve the murder. Their goal is to close every single case. And if they don't, they're seen as a failure. Their job depends on figuring it out. And there's a lot of pressure from outside the force as well. The victim's family is calling in every day, asking for updates and the progress of the case. And it hardly seems like it's ever moving fast enough, especially back then. Not to mention how scared the community becomes. This means that detectives like Polanco are in a hurry to figure things out. He wasted no time and began interviewing every employee at the Rainley location. Just days later, by October 27th, he had interviewed every single person on the staff. Each one seemed to have adored Nancy, and Polanco was understandably frustrated because he had no viable suspects yet. He told all the employees to report any suspicious behavior that they witnessed going forward to the Austin PD. Soon after this, Nancy's autopsy results did come back from the Travis County Medical Examiner's Office. She had an entrance wound three and a half inches above her left ear. Her hair was shaved in this location to get a closer look at the surface of the wound. There was no stippling present, which meant that the gun was not close up when it was shot, but more of what was described in the report as a distant type wound. The projectile went through her skull, through the brain, from the back to the front, toward the front orbital area, and was lodged inside. They were able to retrieve a mushroom 22 caliber lead bullet, which was preserved and sent over to Sergeant Hector Polanco, on 10 26 88 and 9 40 a.m. The next part of this report confirmed investigators' fears about Nancy being violated by a male perpetrator. For the manner of death, the report reads, quote, it is my opinion, based on the investigation of the circumstances and findings at autopsy, that the decedent, Nancy Lena DePriest, came to her death as a result of a gunshot wound of the head, distant type associated with sexual assault, and it was ruled a homicide, end quote. The semen sample was sent to the lab for DNA processing, which, by the way, I, sh I don't even really need to say this, but it was limited. They used to call it DNA fingerprinting back then. It had nothing to do with fingerprints. It was just mapping of the DNA. And it was just introduced that year in forensic-type cases. Some of you may not be interested like I am in all of this, but you can learn some things in videos like this one. And then you can tell other people later on. I think as consumers of true crime— we should kind of know the history of evidence examination technology. First, it's always great to be able to say deoxyribonucleic acid, which is abbreviated as DNA. I'm sure you can see why it took me so long to be able to pronounce that. But DNA testing started with paternity testing in the 80s. And then they realized we get, you know, 50% of our DNA from our father, the other half from our mother. And this advanced to being used as a forensic tool. However, 99.9% of human DNA sequences are the same in every single human being. But there are some of our DNA that is, of course, unique to each of us except for identical twins. So the analysis would isolate that part of the DNA. But back in 1988, the science relied heavily on blood typing. And as you're probably aware, many of us have the same blood type. There are only four main blood types, A, B, a, B, and O. And you can have a combination of those. So there are eight different blood types. Do you know yours? I am typo positive. And oddly, so is my boyfriend, John. So as you see, 
we can have the same blood type as someone else who also looks entirely different from us. If you're not aware, our blood type doesn't lend much to telling what we look like. So it's not exactly a reliable tool when figuring out who your suspects are. But back then, if somebody was killed and they had, let's say, a blood type of O, and they find other blood on the scene, let's say from the attacker being harmed, and they have a different type of blood, then maybe they're looking for someone with that blood type since it's different from the victims. And that's how they could rule out a suspect. If somebody had a different blood type than what they found on the scene and it wasn't the victims, but semen is actually more likely to be found at crime scenes than blood. So they begin using that to extract the DNA. But back then, they used restriction fragment length polymorphism. You've probably seen this before. Maybe you don't remember the name of it, but it looks like this. It's when lines are compared in two samples. And if they are the same, then they conclude the same person was there. But if not, it's not a match. I'm putting this in the simplest example on the screen. They usually look like this, though. The point is, it wasn't the most accurate science back then. Plus, you needed a sample of a suspect's DNA to test and compare to what you found. So the detectives had to do the real boots on the ground investigation before this could even come into play. That meant isolating someone as their prime suspect. It wasn't long before the Rainley location pizza was back in business, but now they hired a new security guard named Lorenzo. Everyone was scared there would be another robbery and someone else could be hurt. So Lorenzo actually stood guard at the front door and he monitored the restaurant and the patrons inside and outside. Well, remember when the investigators told the employees if they saw anything suspicious to call them? Well, let's fast forward to November 9th, a little after two weeks from when Nancy was killed. Austin PD got a call from the night manager at the Rainley Pizza location. She said that two young men had come into the restaurant. They pulled into the parking lot, and they just sat there with their headlights shining toward the restaurant for about five minutes. And then they went inside, sat down, and ordered two beers. They were just sitting there, sipping their beers while scanning the restaurant in silence for a while. Then they clinked their beer mugs together. But what was weird was what they were overheard saying by the security guard. They were toasting in Nancy's memory. But as far as the night manager knew, these guys didn't know Nancy personally, so why were they even there? And they were happily at the scene where her murder took place making a toast. That raised a red flag. But there was more. Lorenzo was on duty that night, and one of the young men approached him asking why he was acting like a security guard. The guy introduced himself as Richard. He started asking about Nancy, whether it was true that she was found near the cash register, and if the police had identified any suspects. He also wanted to know if Nancy had been shot. When Lorenzo said that was classified information, Richard actually speculated that two people might be responsible. Lorenzo was getting creeped out now, so we asked Richard who he was and where he was at the time of the murder. Richard replied that he worked at the North Lamar Pizza Hut and was opening that store at the same time that Nancy was killed. Then the two men left before they had even finished their beers. Well, that was another red flag. Richard worked at another Pizza Hut location and opened, so that meant that he had a master key. The night manager from the Rainley location reported all of this suspicious behavior to the police, who made note of everything. As someone interested in true crime, I've spent hundreds of hours researching cases before, but I don't recommend hanging out in the area where someone was killed and then asking a bunch of questions, especially not long after they were murdered, because it will raise a red flag. Sergeant Boardman of the Austin PD followed up with Lorenzo to see what he knew about these two men in the restaurant and Nancy's death. Lorenzo had not heard what type of bullet was found in Nancy's body, and he also didn't know what items of clothing had caused the bathroom to flood or any specifics about the crime scene. Then Sergeant Boardman started looking into Richard from the North Lamar Pizza Hut, and this is what he found. Richard Danzinger was 18 years old. He worked at both the Red Lobster and the North Lamar Pizza Hut location. He had just started dating his manager, Donna, and in September, his roommate, Chris Ochoa, was a line cook at the Pizza Hut on Guadalupe Street. Chris was 22 years old, and definitely the guy who had gone with Richard to make that toast to Nancy's memory. This meant that all three of them were employees who knew the layout of Pizza Hut and two people in association had master keys. Boardman had a feeling that Richard and Chris were somehow involved. 
and wondered if Nancy might have known them, since remember, she bounced to different restaurants in the Austin area, and she played on the Pizza Hut softball team. Had Richard or Chris maybe targeted Nancy? Had they tried to rob the store and didn't know that Nancy was going to be there that morning? Or were they just innocently having a drink at a location? Sergeant Boardman figured out the address to Richard and Chris's apartment, which they shared with Richard's brother Ralph and a roommate named Roger Lewis. Richard and Chris weren't home at the time, so Sergeant Boardman found Donna's address. On Friday, November 11th, he paid her a visit. When he arrived, her boyfriend Richard was sitting on the couch. Boardman asked Richard if he would mind coming outside and talking to him for a moment. Richard agreed. Outside, Boardman explained that he was investigating Nancy DePriest's murder, and they hoped that Richard would come into the police station and give a statement. That's when the story gets strange. This is from the records of the investigators involved, and at this point, there was Sergeant Boardman, Detective Polanco, and Detective Sergeant Edward Balaja. The report was that Richard pointed through the door in Donna's direction, saying, that's my alibi, pointing to his girlfriend. He explained he was asleep at the time that Nancy was murdered. But didn't he initially say to Lorenzo that he had been opening up the North Lamar location that morning? Sergeant Boardman asked Richard to come back with him to the station where he took turns interviewing Richard with Detective Polanco. Richard said he heard that Nancy was shot in the back of the head with a 22 caliber gun and that the perpetrator had stuffed a blue apron in the woman's restroom to flood the store and erase evidence. The investigators were pretty shocked. They didn't know how he could have known that. Lorenzo, the security guard closer to the case, hadn't even known those details. Richard said he heard it from Donna's supervisor, the general manager of the North Lamar store. But Boardman already had that supervisor's number on speed dial. He left the room called them up and asked them what color was the apron that was found in the restroom. And the supervisor said they didn't know. So how did Richard know these details? This was not looking good for him. Boardman told Richard nobody could have possibly known that information unless they had been at the crime scene. Richard denied that he was ever there. He wasn't fessing up. So later that night, Sergeant Balaja questioned him. And Balaja asked Richard what he could tell him about the murder at Pizza Hut. The same questions again. Richard claimed he didn't know anything. He said he had an alibi. He said that on the night of October 23rd, he and his friend Chris bought some beer. They went to Donna's house at 10 p.m. and Donna was ironing in the kitchen. So Chris and Richard just hung out and played cards. They invited some of Donna's friends to play a drinking game with them around 11 p.m. Then Chris was getting tired, so he left. But within minutes, he said Chris came back to the apartment saying that his car key was broken. So they called Roger, their other roommate, to come get him. At 2 a.m. on October 24th, the early morning hours of the morning Nancy was shot, Roger and Chris left together, and Richard spent the night at his girlfriend Donna's house. Richard said that he and Donna were pretty drunk at that point, and Richard knew he had to get to work by 8 o'clock in the morning, but he passed out. Before he knew it, it was 9.30 and he was late. He said that Donna got a phone call from the North Lamar Pizza Hut, it was the morning manager, and they were contacting to try to find Richard. As soon as Donna hung up, Richard got ready, and he rushed out to Pizza Hut after 10 a.m. Interesting. Was he really sleeping, or was he over at the Brainley location violating and killing Nancy? So this was Richard's alibi, his girlfriend. He hadn't even answered Donna's phone, so the morning shift manager wouldn't be able to confirm that he was really there. Donna could be covering for him. Richard allegedly told the Sergeant Palaja you don't have any evidence that would link me to this crime. When Balaja suggested that Richard's explanation of the night made him sound guilty of capital murder, Richard said, you're not going to pin a capital murder on me. But why did he know about the 22 caliber bullet and the blue work apron? However, it's true. There was no direct evidence against him, so he was released. And the police did not write an official statement from him at this point. On the same day, November 11th, while Richard was being interrogated, Chris was working at the Guadalupe Pizza Hut when Sergeant Boardman and a woman detective pulled him aside. They explained they wanted to question him about the murder of Nancy DePriest. Chris, just like Richard, was like, sure. He offered to drive himself to the station, but the detective said they wanted him to come in a police car. Chris had no idea that the police had been called when he and Richard made that toast to Nancy and that they were suspects. Once at the station, Sergeant Boardman asked Chris a few questions 
about the murder while they were sitting in a cubicle. Then they moved him into an interview room. Boardman then left, and another detective came in and introduced himself as Sergeant Polanco. And then he told Chris that on the streets, they called him El Diablo. For context, Sergeant Polanco and Chris both speak Spanish as their first language. El Diablo means the devil, which in the context of an interview room at a police station could be a bit threatening. Recall that I told you that Polanco had this reputation of closing his cases fast and dirty, and one reason is because he didn't play nicely. If you can think of good cop, bad cop, he'd be the bad cop. And it didn't take long for him to use this scare tactic to intimidate Chris. Polanco pounded his fist on the table and even started yelling. Chris appeared to be shocked. Polanco told Chris if he knew who hurt Nancy, he needed to tell them the truth. And now, if Chris didn't tell the truth, he'd be charged with capital murder and given the death penalty, which in Texas is a common sentence. Chris told him he did not know who did this. But after a while, Polanco switched tactics and left the room. There are actually a lot of interesting interrogation tactics that are utilized by investigators. One is to leave the suspect all alone and record them to see if they say anything or do anything out of the ordinary. At this time, it wasn't commonplace to have a video and audio recording going on. But the tactic of making them sweat, so to speak, by leaving them alone to think can work and you can get a confession. Sergeant Balaja was the one that had been interviewing Richard and he came in and he was playing the good cop. So they were utilizing this well-known tactic. Balaja apologized to Chris. He was like, I'm so sorry for my hot-headed partner. He said Chris could go home as long as he was telling them the truth. And again, Chris pushed back and said, I don't know anything. Then Balaja left and Polago came back in. Chris was not under arrest, but he also hadn't requested an attorney. So the questioning continued, and I want to remind everyone, you should always remain silent and ask for an attorney. If you're being questioned, it's your right. It's your right to remain silent, so use it. Polanco asked Chris about his alibi. Chris said at 8 a.m., he was asleep in the apartment that he shared with Roger, Richard, and Ralph. He said he did remember that around maybe 8.30 that morning, he heard Roger talking in the room next to him on the phone with one of the pizza managers and said that Richard was spending the night at Donna's. Polanco wasn't sure if that was the truth. He left, and Balaja entered. And this went on for hours. Hours. It was all they had to go on. They had to get to the bottom of it. Polanco returned. He reminded Chris once again that this was a death penalty state, and they were hoping it would break him down. Chris said he didn't do anything and begged Polanco to please believe him. Then Balaja came back in. And Chris said he only knew what he told them because he saw it on the news. Polanco showed Chris a picture of death row, and he promised he would never get a chance to hug his family again. But still, Chris told him he didn't know anything. That's when Polanco said he knew that Chris didn't have a criminal history and that he was an honor student. He came from a hardworking family. He had no history of violence. And that meant he must be covering for his friend Richard and he needed to come clean. If not, they would both go down for this crime and be put to death by lethal injection. When Polanco used the scare tactic to elicit shock, he showed Chris an autopsy picture of Nancy. He said, don't you feel bad for her? And he asked Chris to confess who did this. Polanco did think that Chris had maybe seen everything happen and blocked it out of his memory. He was just trying to get Chris to remember how he was involved. or maybe. He was just trying to protect Richard. Maybe he didn't want to rat out his longtime friend. So Polanco said that Richard was in the next room and he was ready to put all the blame on Chris. Another tactic where you pit one suspect against the other, hoping that one of them will break. The detective went on to explain that Richard was going to probably walk free because he was a white guy and white guys always got the better end of the stick. He told Chris, it's time for a minority to have the chance to win. Chris still claimed he didn't know anything. Polanco left and came back and said when Chris goes to jail, he would be fresh meat for all the other inmates. Well, they were well into the interview at this point. Chris thought he was going to be sent to jail. They interviewed him for 20 hours over the course of two days. He was exhausted. 
He hadn't seen the sun in hours, and he just wanted to go home. So that's when he started to crack. He was ready to make his statement. His story changed, which is never a good sign. Detective Blanco pulled out a typewriter and asked if Chris was involved in the crime, and Chris said yes. But he admitted Richard was the mastermind. Chris ended up confessing that he was the accomplice, but it gets crazier. If this was simple, I would not be sharing this case. It's wild. After typing out Chris's horrific recollection of what he and Richard did to poor Nancy, Chris was finally ready to go home, and he really thought that he was going to just go home after this. Of course, Bellagia said he couldn't let him leave because he had to give them hair, blood, and semen samples. Chris agreed, and they went to the hospital and took all the samples they needed. Do they take semen samples? I'm sitting here scratching my head about that one. I always thought they took regular DNA and just used the semen on scene to extract the DNA. I don't know. This was the 80s. They did a lot of things back then. Chris agreed. They went to the hospital. They took the samples, like I said, but they still needed a warrant to arrest him, and they weren't actually done talking to him, but they weren't ready to take him to jail either. They'd actually gotten a hotel for Chris for the weekend as they sorted through all of the gruesome details of Nancy's murder. They tried to explain to Chris that since he made this statement against his friend Richard, it really wouldn't be a good idea to go back to the apartment that they shared. What if Richard came after him? At this point, Chris was so exhausted, he just agreed to whatever. He stayed at the hotel, but he did call Roger and ask, do you have a number for a lawyer? Well, on Monday, November 14th, Bellagio and Polanco came to the hotel and took Chris back to the police station. Blanco had found out that Chris called Roger looking for an attorney. So now Polanco has more reason to suspect that these guys are guilty if the confession wasn't enough. Even though, just so you know, getting a lawyer is not evidence of guilt. At the station, they begin the next half of Chris's interrogation. He even agreed to a recorded statement. At first, he said on tape, that Richard had gone inside to rob the Pizza Hut, and Chris waited outside the entire time. But then they made him take a polygraph test. When the investigators came back, they told him he failed. But as we know, polygraphs are not a great indication of whether or not someone's truly lying. They're just kind of a scare tactic. Polanco told Chris that he thought that Chris was inside the Pizza Hut when Nancy was killed, and that Chris was the one that shot Nancy even though Richard was the one who had the idea in the first place. And if he did and confessed his guilt, they could reduce his sentence from death and give Chris 60 years in prison instead. That's when Chris said yes, and he confessed to everything. In the police's statement, Chris said he and Richard had planned to rob the Rainy Street Pizza Hut while they were playing cards at Donna's house. Chris didn't want to do it, but Richard asked Chris for his help, and that was his best friend. He finally agreed. Richard told Chris that he would invite Roger over and Chris could go home with him. And then Richard could stay at Donna's. Therefore, both of them would have alibis. At 7 a.m., the two of them would meet up in McDonald's, which they did. Richard showed up with a gun in his pants, driving his girlfriend's car. They parked their cars at a nearby apartment complex across the street, and they watched Nancy get dropped off outside Pizza Hut around 7.30 and go inside. That's when they used Donna's key to open the side door. Inside, Nancy was preparing dough. She saw Chris and she said, what's up, Chris? That's when Richard told Nancy to shut up and show him the money. He threatened her at gunpoint and Nancy gave him the money from the safe. That's when Richard promised to have fun and proceeded to violate her in multiple places around the restaurant. Richard then instructed Chris to tie her up and to also have some fun with her. Polanco wrote that Chris said they did this to her eight times while Nancy begged for them to stop. Then Richard said that they would have to kill Nancy because she could recognize them. Richard then shot Nancy in the head and both of them proceeded to violate her again before putting her clothes in the sink to wash away all the evidence. Chris signed the statement in front of witnesses. I am truly shocked by how brutal that story was, but wait, because you haven't even heard the details. Those details come out at trial, and it is just unreal. But there were some inconsistencies, like the timing. Remember that Todd said he came back with his motorcycle, and that the last time he saw Nancy was not when she was originally dropped off. 
So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there because they said that they went in and started doing this to her after she got dropped off. But the thing is, we know she saw her husband. So that wasn't exactly a good time frame. They also wanted to know why Richard and Chris decided not to relock the Pizza Hut door if they had the key. Did they just forget? Were they in a rush? And was there any evidence that Nancy knew Chris and Richard and if they had engaged in intercourse? And how many times if they only found one hair at the scene? There was also that call to the produce company at 8.30. But it's true, sometimes criminals don't exactly have time to look at their watches. They have more important things at hand, right? After Sergeant Balaja had sat through this confession, he called and told his brother that he had just interviewed the devil himself that Chris had dead eyes, and he's never been in the presence of someone so cold before in his life. Wow, that's scary. I know I haven't gone into the details about this confession. We will get there. But the gist of it was that it all started as a robbery and escalated when they realized that Nancy could identify them, so they had to kill her. Chris was arrested on November 14th, but now it was up to a jury to decide whether the evidence existed that matched up with this confession. And I told you, much more will come at trial. On November 15th, Chris's partner in crime, Richard, was visiting his family when he was also arrested. He provided blood, hair, semen, and saliva samples, and he and Chris were both charged with capital murder. But here's the thing. In Texas, a confession is not enough evidence to convict someone of murder. There has to be evidence tying the confession to the truth. There just wasn't yet. They had to prove that the hair and the bullet shell found at the scene belonged to either Richard or Chris. But these tests take time. As for Nancy's family, Jeanette found out Chris and Richard were in jail and she felt a sense of relief. Blanco told her he had no doubt he had found the men who had done this to her daughter and that the confession was shocking. That was really hard for her to hear. It was bad enough to imagine what Nancy went through, but to know the truth was horrific. It was a lot to take in. Actually, since Nancy's murder, Jeanette was depressed and she exhibited signs of self-harm. She was smoking four packs of cigarettes every day and she lost 30 pounds. Her sister had to slap her across the face and say that she needed to take care of herself and her grief and her self-hatred over Nancy's death and transform that into the hatred for two people who did this. Knowing that they were behind bars didn't mean she was able to move on, but justice was going to be served. Nancy's death left a huge hole in the lives of Todd and her daughter, Sylvia, and Jeanette, and Eddie, and Eddie Jr. No one could believe something like this could happen to someone like Nancy. On November 21st, Chris and Richard had their bond hearings. At the hearing, the defense argued they could not be held in jail without bond unless the prosecution provided evidence that a jury would be able to convict them. The prosecution said there was no evidence. So they were held with bond, and each of them could have paid the bond, but it was $100,000 each. So they were going to stay in jail. Now they had to wait for the Texas Department of Public Safety to process the DNA of the semen and the hair found at the crime scene. When the results came back, Todd was ruled out as a suspect. They had to do this, even though he had an alibi, because the spouse is usually involved somehow. But this time, Todd's semen and hair did not match up. Richard's semen sample also came back negative, which means even though Chris confirmed that Richard had violated Nancy multiple times, Richard likely didn't. Or maybe he didn't finish, so to speak. But it was Chris's DNA that came back unconfirmed. He was the one that could not be eliminated and ruled out. In 1988, like I tried to explain, it was possible that if someone had the same blood type as Nancy, her blood group markers would hide the perpetrator's DNA. It's a very tricky analytical process. Because the Texas Department could not differentiate Chris's sample, they sent it to the Forensic Science Associates. The DNA analyst, Edward Blake, said that because of Chris's DQ alpha markers, don't ask, which he shared with 16% of the Mexican-American population, his semen sample could not be ruled out. This is always fascinating to me. It goes way over my head, but I still love learning about it. Now, let me tell you about that hair. And back then, they did visual comparisons 
We're talking not too scientific here, although they did look at them under a microscope. The hair was found on the scene, and it was compared to Nancy's, but by comparison, it was ruled out. It did not belong to her. Chris's head and pubic hair did not match up either, but when it was compared to Richard's pubic hair, it was consistent. The hair's color and texture were similar. It was similar enough that it pointed to him as a suspect. But remember, they didn't have the root. They weren't able to test it for actual DNA. And I'm not trying to go all TMI here, but um, comparing pubic hair, I'm pretty sure you know what I'm thinking. How many different styles are there? Please don't Google it. I already did. And apparently there are four basic ones. Look at the screen if you're interested in learning something new today because I did. They're called terminal hairs. And they're obviously a different texture than our scalp hair, as we know. But anyway, in preparation for the trial, Chris's defense attorney, Nate Stark, sat down with him to go over his case. Chris wanted to somehow make a deal to get a lighter sentence and insisted he was actually innocent. Shockingly, his own attorney wasn't buying it. The attorney explained, based on the brutality of his confession, his DNA results being inconclusive, it was clear he was guilty. The only way he was going to avoid death was by pleading guilty and then testifying against his roommate, Richard. That was his best chance at that point. The DNA testers even reached out to Chris's attorney to ask if they wanted another DNA test, and the attorney said no. He said there was no chance Chris was innocent. Also, while Chris and his defense attorney talked, something changed. It seemed as though more information was coming to light. Official documents with the confession in its entirety was typed and completed by Detective Balaja. The date was March 19th, 1989. And one month later, this was a year after Nancy was killed, authorities told the media that Richard was not the one who shot the gun that killed Nancy. It was Chris. He'd confessed. So now the prosecution would only be trying Richard before a grand jury on the sexual-related charges. April 26, a grand jury indicted Richard. On May 5th, Chris pleaded guilty to first-degree murder on a plea deal that he would receive life in prison without parole and not murder. If he testified against Richard, Richard Danzinger's trial began on January 22nd, 1990. Richard pled not guilty. The star witness was his former roommate and friend, Chris Ochoa. The DA prosecuting the case was Claire Dawson, and she told Nancy's mother not to be in court that day. She didn't want her to hear the brutality that her poor daughter faced. But Jeanette told her, you don't understand. I have to. I can't live without knowing what they did to my baby. So she stayed, and she listened as Chris took the stand. I pulled up part of this transcript, and I was shocked. It's just so horrible. And I can't even share everything because it's not only disrespectful because uh, you could use your imagination, but I'd certainly not be permitted to say it on this platform. It started with what we already know, that on October 23rd, Richard and Chris went to Donna's. They drank. They played some games. Richard wanted money. Chris didn't want to do it. Richard had a whole plan with Roger and Donna as their alibis. At 5 o'clock in the morning, Roger came over. He and Chris drove both their cars to their apartment instead of Roger and Chris taking the same car. Chris only slept an hour before he committed the crimes against Nancy. Chris and Richard went in with the key. They demanded that Nancy open the safe and give them all the money, which she did. But this is where the story changes. When Richard decided they needed to kill Nancy, they had already gagged her. Then they brought her to the hall near the bathrooms, the area where the video games are, where people normally waited on their pizzas, and they threw her on the bench, and they tied her hands behind her back. Chris said that Richard then unzipped his pants. And let's just say he was doing something to himself that was really inappropriate while telling Nancy he was going to bone her. Then Richard forced her to kneel down, then handed Chris the gun and told Chris to kill her. Chris got behind her. He had the gun in his left hand, and he had his right hand on her right shoulder. Chris said that she was begging for him not to hurt her, saying, please don't, please don't. And he said he pulled the trigger and shot her in the back of the head. Then she slumped forward, and when he let her go, her body fell face first 
into the tile floor. That's when Chris said he asked himself, what have I done? Then Chris said they took her into the woman's bathroom and he points to where it is on a diagram so the jury can see. The prosecutor asked how they got her in there and he said they dragged her. Chris said he held the door open and Richard picked her up from the shoulders and dragged her inside. They had previously gagged her and at this point, Richard took that gag from her mouth. Chris said he just yanked it off and proceeded to have intercourse with her. Down there and also in her mouth. Yeah. The prosecutor asked Chris if Nancy was bleeding, and he said yes. But when he was asked if she was moving, he said no. At that point, they thought she was already dead. Wow. How cruel and how disgusting. After Richard was finished, he told Chris it was his turn to have some fun with Nancy. And at first, Chris said he didn't want to do it, but that made Richard mad. And he told Chris, you're gonna do it. So he finally said, all right. And he took his bleep out of his pants. And Richard said, you're gonna have some fun with her too. Chris said he proceeded to put his bleep into her bleep and he ejaculated inside and then pulled it out. The prosecutor asked if Nancy was saying anything to them before she was killed. And Chris said that Nancy was saying, please stop, don't. But Richard told him he wanted to tie her up and gag her, so they did. And they said they used a scarf. It made her beg for her life. That's when Nancy's mom became physically ill in the courtroom. She was so sick to her stomach listening to how much her poor daughter suffered and what these nasty, vile men did to her. She had to leave the room. She ran to the restroom to throw up. Back to Chris's testimony. He said to clean up the scene, he wiped down all the countertops that they had touched and helped Richard use the bathroom water to wash Nancy's body and erase as much evidence as possible. Then they wiped down the restroom. Then they used the blue apron to stop up the sink drain, left the water running to cover their tracks. Chris gave the money to Richard, and together they left in separate vehicles. Then Chris said on November 9th, the night that they visited the Rainley Pizza Hut, Richard and Chris were at Donna's house again. They'd been drinking wine, hanging out, when Richard said he'd been at that location that day. Apparently, while he was at work at a different location, his boss had asked him to bring some checks over there. At that point, Richard asked Chris, hey, do you want to go over there and see it? And Chris said he just wanted to go home, but Richard convinced him. Chris admitted he could be a bit gullible at times, so they drove over to the Pizza Hut anyway. That's when they sat down, they both ordered a beer, and Richard told Chris that he recognized the security guard and the manager. Chris didn't want to be there. You already know what happened. They walked over to the security guard, started making some weird comments and questions about the murder, and after this, they went home. You know the rest. Polanco and Balaja both testified for the prosecution, saying that Chris was shaken up during his interview, but Richard was calm and couldn't be intimidated. Donna also testified against her boyfriend, Richard. She said the night before the murder, Chris and Richard were talking as she was ironing in the kitchen, so she couldn't hear them, and they could have talked about anything. At 11 p.m., her friend arrived, and they played a drinking game. Richard and Chris left for a few minutes and said Chris's car key was broken. At 2 a.m., they called Roger to come pick Chris up. Roger showed up, stayed for a drink, and then Donna was drunk enough that she lost track of time and Roger and Chris left at some point together. The next day, she said she woke up to the phone ringing, and Richard was the one who answered the phone, not Donna, and it was Donna's supervisor, asking why the store wasn't open. Donna and Richard started getting ready for work around 9.15. Donna actually had children, and as Richard's supervisor, it was her role to pick up the slack. So it was a mad dash for her to get her two kids ready to leave, and then when Donna got in her car, she realized that the front seat was backed up more than usual. It indicated to her that someone else had been driving her car, but she said the keys were on their hook as usual when she woke up at 9.15. Donna then dropped her kids off and she and Richard arrived at Pizza Hut that morning after 10 o'clock, a different location, and nothing was unusual about the rest of the day. But when the two of them heard that Nancy had died, Richard looked at her and said, I was with you, right? And Donna wasn't so sure. She had a lot to drink and was a heavy sleeper. It was possible that Richard could have taken her car 
between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., and she wouldn't have even known it. A corrections officer who worked at the Travis County Jail also testified against Richard. He said that on April 25th, Chris was helping him serve dinner to other inmates when Richard said, that's the mother effer that squealed on me. And he threw his drink in Chris's face and they started to get into a fight. And the correction officer had to get between them and separate them. On the other hand, Richard's defense said the only evidence connecting him to Nancy's murder was a pubic hair that looked similar to his. This wasn't concrete evidence. It isn't an exact science, hair comparison that is, and Richard testified on his own behalf. He sat there in front of this huge crowd wearing a bulletproof vest and said he'd been at Donna's the entire night and the morning when the crime occurred. Jeanette was sitting in the crowd and she was irate. Richard was just staring at her the entire time and was adamant that he had not seen Nancy that morning and he would never do anything to her. He said the cops were lying and Chris was lying. Jeanette felt sick that he was maintaining his innocence when there was so much circumstantial evidence against him. Why would the seat of Donna's car be pushed back? Why would Richard know about a 22 caliber gun and a blue apron? After deliberating for three hours, the jury found Richard guilty on February 1st. The next day at a sentencing trial, they decided in seven and a half minutes that Richard would get a life sentence. One of the jurors, Liz Rowland, was interviewed. And she said that of course she believed what Chris told everyone. And she believed they deserved the sentence that they were going to get. The jury was being congratulated for putting them behind bars. Nancy's parents, Jeanette and Eddie, felt completely relieved that after 15 months, the judicial system worked. Richard was going to jail. But Jeanette reminded the public that this trial was about getting justice for Nancy. And she didn't want Nancy to be remembered by Richard speaking for himself at trial. She wanted people to remember how beautiful Nancy was and how much she loved her family. The week afterward, Chris Ochoa was sentenced to life in prison for capital murder. The case seemed finished, but in the next few years, more evidence would come out. And bear with me, because this information is wild. That is why I wanted to cover this case. It already seems so unbelievable. Well, you just wait. I know that it's hard with so much information, but I'm telling you, your patience will pay off. This case will stick with you. Let me take you to six years after Richard and Chris were put behind bars. Investigator Manny Fuentes was assigned to investigate some very strange letters that were being sent all over the place from a Texas inmate. He was a really bad guy. He was already serving three life sentences for sex crimes and armed robberies. The letters were full of crazy ramblings, which is actually pretty common. There's lots of bored inmates with nothing better to do with their time. This inmate's name was Akeem Joseph Marino, and he had apparently been sending letters to different politicians, police stations, and investigators for years. On February 17th, 1998, Akeem wrote a letter to George W. Bush, who was the governor of Texas at the time. He received this four-page handwritten letter in the mail that month. This guy was one of the worst. He was sexist, racist. He had a long criminal history. I'm not going to go into it all. But he really wasn't someone that most of us, especially a governor, would give the time of day. But Detective Fuentes was tasked with giving them his time. And I have this letter. I went through it word by word. It starts with the subject line, murder confession. That should get anyone's attention. Then it reads, Dear Governor Bush, sir, my name is Akeem Joseph Marino. And then he gives his inmate number and where he's currently confined. He writes that he's serving three life sentences plus three 10-year sentences for crimes committed in Austin, Texas in both 1988 and 1990. Then he goes on to say that while in Austin in 1988, he also robbed and sexually violated a 20-year-old woman at the Pizza Hut on Rainley Lane. This was in late October of 1988. After purchasing the murder weapon, via the Austin American Statesman Classified section. The woman's name was Nancy Lena DePriest, and I have not been convicted for this crime. I was arrested in El Paso, Texas, where the murder weapon was confiscated by the El Paso Police Department. However, the federal government convicted him on other charges and not Nancy's murder. Apparently, he had now gone through a religious transformation after attending an Alcoholics and Narcotics Anonymous program in prison. He wanted to come clean about being responsible for Nancy's murder. 
He said, I'm 100% responsible. Well, as Detective Fuentes was looking into this, he was told many times by the Austin PD that he was wasting his time. All he had to do was look at Chris Ochoa's confession. The guys who really did this were already in jail and that he should just ignore this lunatic who's writing these absurd letters. But just to be sure, Fuentes went to visit Chris in prison that same year, but Chris absolutely refused to speak to him. His first words were, I have nothing to say. Just let me do my time. It seemed like his colleagues were right. He was wasting his time. But there was something about all of this that just seemed off. For one thing, back in 1992, two years after both men had been on trial, Detective Polanco, remember him? Diablo? Well, he was fired. He had been accused of coercing false confessions and lying on the witness stand, not in Chris and Richard's trial, but enough other cases that it was clear he wasn't reliable and neither was his shoddy police work. Someone had caught him on video beating up a suspect. I mean, if he did this once, there's a strong possibility he'd done it again. Polanco faced charges, and then he was exonerated. Was videotaped violence not enough to convict him? I don't know. I guess not. Because Polanco went right back to his job. And by 1998, he was still serving on the force. However, this raised Fuentes' suspicions. He wanted to use his own skills to reanalyze this case from scratch. So he went back to square one. Was it true what Akeem said in his letter? That Chris and Richard were basically arrested for a crime that he committed? Fuentes pulled up Nancy's case files and started examining all the photos taken at the crime scene. He poured over the evidence piece by piece, and he noticed something. A few things. One was the shell casing found in the bathroom where Nancy's body had been found. She was not in the hallway where Chris stated that he shot her, and neither was the shell casing. Why would Chris move the shell casing to the bathroom? Had it somehow made its way there on its own? It didn't seem likely. Plus, there was something even more telling, the blood spatter. Upon further investigation, Fuentes noticed there was a bucket in the bathroom that had high velocity blood stains on it, which meant it was nearby when Nancy was shot. So she was shot in the bathroom, not the hallway. The stains on the hallway wall were not consistent. They were low velocity stains, most likely from when emergency personnel was trying to either attend to her or move her or revive her. That's when Fuentes decided he may be onto something. He went back to Akeem's letter, now looking at it with more confidence that it might lead him in the right direction. He called the El Paso PD and referenced the case regarding Akeem from 1988. It happened only two days after Nancy's murder, and unbelievably, they still had the gun in evidence. He requested it, and he brought it in for forensic testing. It was also a 22 caliber, the same caliber of bullet recovered from Nancy's head. However, Fuentes dug deeper into Akeem's letter, and there was something that stood out. Akeem claimed that at the time of his arrest, he literally had the keys to the Pizza Hut in his possession, as well as two bank bags with the name of the Pizza Hut and the bank on them. And these items were put into his personal property locker in the county jail when he was being processed. And that's crazy to me. Clearly, if you look at these items, they're evidence from a crime. They're not a wallet or personal in nature, but okay. So Akeem said these items stayed there for 14 months until his friend, Janet Vaughn, who he provided an address for, picked up all his personal property when he was finally transferred to prison. He said she took it all to his parents' house, where it remains till that day. He was even paroled in 1990, but rearrested for another offense. And that was when his cellmate told him that two men had confessed to Nancy's murder, which just baffled him. He told his cellmate they had the wrong guys. Now, he didn't admit that he did it, but he said he knew the guy who did. This was before his spiritual awakening. The letter went on to explain that he had written to the Texas District Attorney's Office multiple times since 1996, and every single letter had been ignored. And that is when he wrote to Bush. And the governor's office didn't get back to him either. I mean, at this point, Bush was most likely trying to prepare to run for president. So maybe he was just a little busy, but I know it can take months before you get a response if you get one at all. But months and months passed, and Akeem never got a response, but he never gave up. 
Akeem wrote again, this time to the police. He said in that letter that if they went to his house, they would find all the evidence involved in the crime. This included the bank bags, the handcuffs that had been used to restrain Nancy. But the Austin Police Department was skeptical. Here was this random guy writing them from prison saying he was responsible for a case that they'd solved years ago. But now that Fuentes was on the case, he sent an officer to Akeem's parents' house, and they were able to find everything he had promised. The 22 caliber bullets, the bank bag, which held exactly $150 that was missing from the safe, a pair of handcuffs, which were sent to the crime lab for DNA testing. What? I told you this is crazy, but it didn't automatically mean they believed Akeem. He could have been involved in the crime with Chris and Richard. Maybe they made some kind of deal, but the letter had already stated that he was the only one responsible. And he didn't know these other guys. Nevertheless, the Austin PD tried to make a connection. They looked and looked for one. Jail phone records, mail, shared cellmates. But there was nothing. So Fuentes decided to speak with Akeem himself. He was brought to the Austin Police Department for an interview. Akeem was calm and confident, and he told a very compelling story. He said, that on the morning of October 24th, 1988, he was looking for a restaurant to rob. He went around randomly looking for ones that only had one car in the parking lot before opening hours. That way, there would most likely only be one person inside. He dressed like a repairman, carrying a toolbox and everything, pretending he was there to fix something. That was his ruse. Well, he admits that he first stopped at a restaurant up the street from Pizza Hut called Magic Time Machine. A man came to the door and actually let him inside, but he aborted the mission. He was hoping to find a woman inside alone. He was on a mission. He was out seeking revenge on a woman from his past who was white with blonde hair, a security guard that he felt had wronged him. He had promised himself if he found someone that resembled her that day, he would blow her head off. Yikes. Well, sadly, he found one when he stopped at Pizza Hut. He used the same ruse, and it worked with Nancy. She let him in, and he followed her to the back just as the phone rang. He let her answer it, but as soon as she was done, he asked her to come over to the beverage area because he needed to show her something. That's when he pulled out his gun and told her, this is a robbery, and to give her all the money in the safe, which she did. Then he forced her at gunpoint into the men's restroom, where he told her to take off all of her clothes. She complied, and he tied her hands behind her back with her bra and made her go back to the storage area where he confessed to violating her only one time. Before he told her to go back to the men's room, he explained to her that he was going to handcuff her to the plumbing and leave her to be found later. Sadly, when she kneeled down to be handcuffed to the pipe under the sink, Akeem said he shot her in the back of the head. She had no idea he was going to do it. She hadn't seen it coming. It was quick, and she didn't beg for her life or say anything. When it was all over, he said that he searched for the shell casing, but in haste, he couldn't find it and didn't want to spend any more time there, so he left it behind and fled. This was a lot to take in. But Fuentes decided to check out the magic time machine story, and sure enough, the manager at the time, Oscar Salas, said that a man did come by that morning. He let him in, he went to the back of the building, and then he just left without saying a word. This was all adding up. Had they had this information from the beginning, they probably wouldn't have believed Chris and Richard. But this meant that they lied about everything. Why? And on top of all this, it turns out, George Bush's office admitted that Bush had received this letter. They only ignored it because he claimed that the district attorney's office had been notified. As for why the DA didn't do anything with this evidence. Maybe it got lost, but it's unlikely. The state probably didn't want to admit that they had gotten the wrong guys. I mean, that's taking a big hit to admit you got it wrong. After this, Chris was visited by investigators, but he thought they were going to accuse him of another crime and force another confession. He was afraid that if he said he was innocent, then he would be seen as not having any remorse for Nancy and the parole board would never consider him for release. They asked him if he was innocent, and he said no. 
that he and Richard were responsible. But Chris started to have some hope. In June of 1999, he wrote a letter to the Wisconsin Innocent Project who took on his case. At this point, the Texas authorities were looking into the case and hoping to actually exonerate both Chris and Richard. I know I've only been talking about Chris, and there's a reason for that. Unfortunately, Richard wasn't exactly able to speak with detectives the way that Chris was. Because back on February 27th of 1991, less than a year after being incarcerated, Richard was attacked in prison. Another inmate misidentified him as someone they knew, and they tried to kill him. He was kicked in the head multiple times. It was brutal. Richard was taken to the hospital where he underwent surgery, and they had to remove part of his brain. At 4 a.m., his parents got the call from a chaplain telling them Richard was in the ICU and probably wouldn't make it, that he might only have days to live. But he survived. However, after such a traumatic event, he had permanent brain damage and could not even take care of himself. Surprisingly, he was put back into general population at prison, where he was consistently taken advantage of. He was beaten. He was tortured in many ways that I don't even want to mention, but I'm sure you know what they did to him. He was just rotting away for something he possibly had no involvement in. By the year 2000, DNA technology had advanced a lot. So they took DNA samples from Akim in August of that year. At this point, 12 years had passed. And though DNA processing takes a while, it was a lot more accurate than it used to be. Multiple labs tested the semen samples found at the crime scene, as well as the hair, and they compared it to Chris and Richard again. They were not a match. Chris and Richard were exonerated. The semen samples didn't match up either. Recall Chris's was never really a match. It just couldn't be eliminated. Well, it turns out there were 3 million other people that shared that genetic marker and the hair did not belong to Richard. As for Akeem, his DNA was a match. He was the killer. When the news broke, as you can probably imagine, it was very shocking, and Detective Polanco retired. He's the true villain in the story. I mean, I cannot believe that he got away with beating people in interviews, promising they would get the death penalty, and calling himself the devil. But I can believe it. It's disgusting. Usually law enforcement is on the side of justice, but sometimes these things happen. Not only Nancy and her family were victims of this crime, Richard and Chris and their families were too. And I understand that it's hard to believe, but people do confess to crimes they did not commit. False confessions are more common than you may think. But didn't Chris know things about the crime scene? His confession was so detailed. Well, let's remember. It was being typed by the investigators, not Chris. And it wasn't recorded in any way. Chris said that his confession included intimate details of the crime scene because officers showed him pictures before he made a statement. But that's not all. Chris explained everything, and it began to make sense. As I briefly explained, he was never in trouble with the law. As a matter of fact, he respected law enforcement. He had the utmost respect for police. He remembers them coming to his school when he was a kid, and they would tell children if they were ever in trouble, they could rely on the cops. Just call 911. Chris was a good student. He came from a close-knit family, and he was looking forward to going to community college for two years and then transferring to the University of Austin. But he didn't come from money, so he was working at Pizza Hut to save up. He believed the cops were on his side when they brought him in. He had no idea they were considering him a suspect. He was just trying to help. Chris completely trusted that law enforcement had his best interest in mind, not understanding that they wanted a confession. Polanco and Balaja claim that they used interview tactics that were commonplace. They weren't doing anything extreme. They were just playing good cop, bad cop to draw a confession out of someone who engaged in sketchy behaviors. But Chris said he felt trapped that Polanco started yelling and threatening him, telling him he would be executed. And we know that Polanco may have been successful at getting confessions, but he wasn't ethical. At one point, Chris said that he asked the woman detective if he could have an attorney, and she said he couldn't have one until he was officially charged. 
which was a lie. Now, maybe Chris misunderstood what was being said, but knowing that they were using extreme interview tactics and not ethical ones, and that Polanco had a track record of finishing his cases quickly, I kind of have a feeling that the cops were probably in the wrong during this interview. They only cared about getting Chris to break down, no matter how they got to that result. It wasn't working on Richard, so they went harder on Chris, physically too. Polanco allegedly grabbed Chris's arm and pointed to the spot where veins are located and said, this is where the needle's gonna go in when they execute you. Polanco said he would be there to watch Chris's execution. Chris told them time and time again he didn't do anything and he begged them to believe him. Then many times Polanco was right in his face enough to smell his breath and feel his spit. He threatened him that he was gonna call the DA and charge him with capital murder. And that's when he finally asked them, what do I have to do to go home? Polanco said Chris needed to just make a statement. So that's when Boardman came in, had Chris sign a blank piece of paper so they could put anything on it that they wanted to because they already had Chris's signature. At that point, he didn't know what to believe. He was scared. And from everything that he learned, he thought Richard had killed Nancy. And he couldn't believe his best friend would do something so horrible. At one point, he said they tried to record his interview on tape, but Polanco was having trouble. He had to stop the tape anytime Chris gave an answer he didn't like. So he got too frustrated to continue. That's when they brought in the typewriter. He wanted it to stop. He wanted to go home. So he complied. When his mother, Dora, heard the news, she was heartbroken and confused. And no one in his family thought he was capable of something like this. They did not believe it. But as time went on and things were looking worse and worse for Chris, especially when his own attorney explained to him that it was best he just took a plea deal to get a lesser sentence. His mom agreed. And at one point, Chris found out she almost had a heart attack and she was in the hospital and he didn't want her to worry. So he took the deal because she had been begging him to do that. Who knows who really came up with everything that was heard at trial? It had been drilled into Chris. He thought at that point, when even his lawyer gave up on him, this is all he had. When he was initially confessing, he actually thought that once he got a lawyer, they'd smooth it over or the real evidence would come out at trial. Texas prisons are really tough, and nobody wanted to listen to Chris. He kept saying he was innocent. At one point, he said he wanted to die. He wrote a letter to his uncle Ronald, and his family was just praying that he wouldn't do anything to himself. His mom said she prayed every day and begged him not to take his life. The truth was that when Chris found out what happened to Nancy, he was horrified. He couldn't believe that that happened to someone who worked at one of the Pizza Huts. But he actually didn't know Nancy personally, and neither did Richard. But they were young kids that were morbidly curious, like many other people, and they wanted to go check out the scene where it happened. They were toasting in her memory, in honor of her, not because they did something to her. That was misinterpreted, and that's all it took. Chris was released from prison in January 2000 after 12 years of being behind bars. Two months later, Richard was released to the care of his family, but sadly, because of the subdural hematoma, he would never again have the quality of life that he had before he went to jail. He needed to be cared for by someone else the rest of his life. However, both Chris and Richard got multi-million dollar settlements from Travis County and the city of Austin for their wrongful convictions. I want to know, do you think that makes up for what they went through? And there's a lot of opinions on this case. That's the reason I wanted to do this story. I've seen so many comments all over the internet talking about how Chris deserved to be in prison for the rest of his life because he testified against Richard knowing it was a lie. And people think that that should be a crime in and of itself. And he was ultimately responsible by extension for Richard's situation. What do you think? I see their point, but we have to remember that Chris went through 20 hours of interrogation. That's not easy, especially for someone with English as a second language. It's hard to say whether he even confessed at all. It was Polanco and Balaja putting words in his mouth and then typing statements themselves. Even Nancy's mother has forgiven Chris and Richard, but especially Chris, but not right away. She probably felt like many of the people I just referenced that truly seemed to have hatred towards Chris. Jeanette, found out through her family that Chris and Richard's convictions were overturned. 
She had just gotten married, and she was at work when she received a phone call from her brother-in-law telling her to turn on the TV. She turned on the TV at work, and there was a Texas district attorney saying that Akeem was Nancy's murderer. Jeanette actually collapsed. She was livid. She was so mad they hadn't called her. All the feelings of devastation and grief boiled up again. She called the DA's office, and she argued with one of the assistants, insisting that they already had the right people, and now they were letting them go. Then she called Chris and Richard's lawyers. Both of them acted defensive, but Jeanette insisted. She didn't care what the verdict was. She just wanted the truth. Well, the truth was they made a mistake. They told Jeanette that the two men were innocent. Jeanette, of course, couldn't call Richard, but she did call Chris. She talked to him in prison, and she apologized to him and his family for all the suffering they went through. Of course, it wasn't Jeanette's fault, but she, like a lot of other people, believed the Texas judicial system was fair. But then she realized sometimes it's not. On January 16, 2001, when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals overturned the convictions of Chris and Richard, Jeanette attended the hearings. And when Chris walked free, she pulled him aside and asked, why did you confess? He said that in that confession room, there was no food, no water, no sunlight, and no hope. And it broke him. He didn't have the courage to defend himself and his friend. And the guilt ate him alive. Jeanette now wanted to find out herself what actually happened. She went to visit Akeem in prison. There she asked, why did you kill Nancy? And he told her that he had heard voices in his head since he was a child. And these voices were telling him to make a human sacrifice. He said she didn't fight him. Nancy was turned away and she would have never seen the bullet coming. Jeanette was actually outraged that she and her family had spent years thinking Nancy had begged for her life for over an hour as two perpetrators tried to take away her dignity time and time again. Jeanette had reoccurring nightmares about the amount of pain Nancy must have been in, but now knowing that this story had been created and exaggerated by police, where is the justice? What happened to Nancy was horrible, but Jeanette still felt a tiny bit of relief knowing that not everything that happened happened the way she thought it had. When the DA's office asked Jeanette if she wanted to pursue the death penalty for Akeem, she refused. She didn't want Akeem's blood on her hands. In fact, Jeanette spent the rest of her life as an activist advocating against the death penalty. She converted to Catholicism, and she believed that a life for a life is not justice. Justice is having to sit and suffer for your consequences the rest of your life. And I want to know what you think of the death penalty. It's definitely a polarizing topic. You're welcome to come to whatever conclusion you want about Chris's innocence or guilt in all of this. But at the very least, I do try my best to have empathy and understanding, which I know isn't easy. But Chris did lose years of his own life. And he said, quote, Sometimes I think about Richard and I feel very bad because I didn't have the courage to face up to whoever might come to me so that he wouldn't go to prison, end quote. I want to mention that in the settlements, Richard received over $10 million and Chris received $5 million. And he gave a big portion of his payout to Richard and his family. But of course, the damage was already done. Remember that juror I told you about? Well, when they found out, they felt awful about being a part of all this. But she admitted that the evidence was very convincing. And the DA even made a statement. She said she truly had no reason not to believe Chris and the confession. She would have never prosecuted him if she had any doubt. But she wasn't armed with everything we know now. I wonder how many cases like this exist. The Texas Rangers began investigating Sergeant Boardman, Balaja, and Polanco for their role in Chris's false confession. The investigators didn't follow up on leads in the first days of their search. They didn't interview all of the witnesses, which is why we didn't get a testimony from Pizza Hut bosses, like Donna's supervisor. They had already jumped to conclusions and formed their own story. And there was little to no documentation of any of these interviews. Finally, in closing, Chris's confession included a ton of details that police knew were wrong. They never corrected him. In his confession, he did say several things that only the police or the perpetrator would know. 
but that's because he was fed all of that information. Unfortunately, because nobody had gotten evidence of Polanco and Bellagio's good cop, bad cop routine, the investigation into their misconduct was unable to be determined. They couldn't tell whether Chris was intimidated into giving a confession, and none of these detectives got into trouble. Akeem's trial was in October of 2022, and he pleaded not guilty by insanity. But he knew exactly what he was doing. He was sentenced to life in prison on top of the three other life sentences for the murder of Nancy DePriest. After all this, Chris actually went to law school at the University of Wisconsin, where he is now an attorney. In 2006, he and Jeanette testified in California that all police interrogations should be videotaped. Jeanette said, quote, I've heard lots of people say, I would never do that. I would never confess to something I didn't do. How do you know what you would do if you were in that interrogation room with the man they call El Diablo? End quote. False confessions happen all the time, not only from people suffering from mental illness or vulnerability, but people like Chris, who are intelligent and have good intentions. As for Nancy, her daughter Sylvia is now in her late 30s. Sadly, Jeanette passed away in 2019 at 69 years old after her battle with lung cancer, and Richard died in 2021 following his own battle with cancer at age 50. Todd and the rest of the family are left with their memories of Nancy, of the hardworking, dedicated, sweet, funny, and bright young woman that she was. It hurts me that so many people suffered due to negligence and the choices of an absolute monster. But I have hope knowing that people like Nancy exist and we can honor their stories and remember them for who they were before their lives were robbed from them. I wanna thank you so very much for watching and listening to Nancy's story. I will see you in my next video. Bye.